Hello and welcome to the Lunchtime Laboratories webinar series. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. My name is Melissa Moran and I am the Education and Wellness Coordinator with Parkinson's Resources of Oregon. We are a nonprofit organization based in Portland, Oregon that provides information, support, and education services to people whose lives have been touched by Parkinson's disease. Lunchtime Laboratories is a collaboration between our organization and the Northwest Parkinson's Foundation in an effort to make information on a variety of topics available through live, interactive video webinars that are free for anyone to access from anywhere. So please feel free to submit your questions throughout the program in the box provided in your browser on the right-hand side. We will save some time at the end of the program to answer, to respond to as many questions as we possibly can. And we received a few questions beforehand that uh, we did submit to our speaker. And so keep in mind that some of those questions might be answered during the lecture, but again, feel free to submit questions as they come. If at any time you're having any te technical challenges, please feel free to submit those questions in the box as well, and one of our organizers will respond. So now to our topic for today, medical, medical marijuana and Parkinson's. Before we get started, I'd just like to say that this is for educational purposes only and not to be taken as medical advice or replace instructions from a medical professional. So today, I'm excited to introduce Dr. Nancy Cook is the hospice medical director at House Call Providers, and we'll be addressing the scientific evidence regarding the effectiveness of marijuana for medical conditions and symptoms. So I would like to turn it over to our speaker for today. Thank you, Melissa. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk about this topic. And um, I um, know that it says taboo. Uh, and, it, and it is in the sense of it's, it's sometimes very difficult for people to get their doctors to talk to them about marijuana. It's certainly not taboo in the community. Um, it's all over the internet, there's lots of information and misinformation out there about marijuana and of course here in Oregon where it's legal not only for medical use but recreational use, um, there's lots of places that you can uh, buy marijuana now. Um, I was told, and I can't verify uh, the accuracy of this, but that they're actually in Portland here where I live. Um, more marijuana dispensaries than there are Starbucks locations, if you can believe that. So I'm a medical director of a hospice program uh, at a nonprofit organization here in Portland. And in that capacity, I am frequently asked about marijuana. So I've done quite a bit of research in this field. I also have worked in the past in outpatient clinics um, with people uh, who have Parkinson's, among other neurological conditions. So I'm going to get started and review some of the objectives for today. I would like to discuss a little bit about the laws um, regarding medical marijuana and touch very briefly on the differences from um, the new recreational marijuana laws. And then I want to review the scientific evidence of marijuana's benefits uh, and adverse effects and specifically focus in on how and when marijuana might help people who have Parkinson's disease. <clears throat> excuse me, and who might want to either avoid using it or to use it with caution. And finally, I'm going to provide some practical information about how to obtain and use medical marijuana, um, keeping in mind that, again, this is educational material only and not specific recommendations um, as a physician to a patient. So to start off with, um, I'm going to give a little context to our discussion. Um, marijuana has a long history of medical use, going back to at least 1500 BC, where it was used in China for a variety of medical conditions, and then um, brought into the U.S. and even grown for export as quote hemp, um, and even added to our own pharmacopoeia. That's a listing of approved medical uses for um, pharmaceutical substances in 1850. At that time, it was freely available in different preparations, preparations like Piso's Cure, and purported to be effective for a variety of conditions, including tetanus, typhus, cholera, alcoholism, anthrax, le leprosy, incontinence, gout, 
epilepsy, insanity, and excessive menstrual bleeding. So those for a lot of things or, or so they thought. Um, then the pendulum started to shift as people had um, bad experiences with these kinds of patent medications, which included a lot of things um, uh, other than marijuana, even um, opioids and cocaine. And um, the states and the federal government started to regulate it. It was for a while uh, included in actual prescription medications that were sold by mainstream pharmaceutical firms in the early 1930s. But later in the 1930s, there was a, an important kind of um, movie um, came out called Reefer Madness, very lurid, um, uh, talking about drug crazed abandon with marijuana. And of course, um, people had a reaction to that. And that reaction was to kind of rein in the use of marijuana. And so the pendulum started going in the other direction to the point in 1970 and sort of the height of the, the 60s, 70s um, culture that it was put on Schedule One in the DEA and made illegal. And Schedule One in the DEA, uh, which is the Drug Enforcement Administration, means that it has no accepted medical use and that it's harmful and addictive. Um, other substances that are on that schedule include um, methamphetamine and heroin. Then in the later 1970s, the pendulum started to go back. Um, the, the Supreme Court ruled that one person's use in that marijuana was actually medically necessary. This was for the treatment of glaucoma. Um, and that in 1985, there was actually a synthetic form of marijuana or tetrahydrocannabinol that was approved by the FDA. In 1992, uh, a, a substance in the body, um, naturally occurring substance in the body called anandamide, which means Sanskrit, in, uh, I mean Sanskrit, which means bliss in Sanskrit, was discovered. And this anandamide is actually uh, sort of like endorphins. It binds to the body's uh, own cannabinoid receptors. So are the, the same receptors that marijuana acts as ingredients bind to. So it's a naturally occurring substance. And that sort of opened the way for people to think of it in a more kind of accepting fashion, that our bodies actually make it. And then we had uh, the beginnings of medical marijuana uh, legalization, starting in California and moving quickly north um, here. There was the Institute of Medicine sort of gave it some legitimacy by publishing a report, um, even though there wasn't a lot of data back in 1999, and there still isn't. And the American College of Physicians supported the use of non smoked marijuana if proven therapeutic values. Um, the next year, the Department of Justice said, well, we may prosecute people who illegally distribute marijuana, but we won't target those people who use marijuana for medical purposes. So that was an important statement. Um, and thereafter, the American Medical Association and other organizations in mainstream medicine have really sought to um, take it off of the Schedule I, um, and, and not only so, so that people could use it and feel um, like they wouldn't be prosecuted, but also so that researchers would be able to uh, do more studies involving marijuana. And we'll see how that being on Schedule 1 is a real problem when it comes to conducting research. And then finally, um, this year, we actually reached kind of a 50-50 in terms of the number of states here that have uh, legalized um, marijuana for medical use. And here's kind of a distribution of those states in the dark green here uh, are places where it's legal to use marijuana for medical purposes. So focusing in on Oregon for a minute, um, I wanted to just review what the law says. Um, and it provides legal protections for people who have a medical marijuana card. Um, and to get that card, you have to have a physician state um, that you have a qualifying debilitating medical condition. And I'll review what those are in a minute. Uh, caregivers can provide assistance for people who aren't able to grow or get their marijuana themselves. And it created a, a, a state department um, with a registration to, system to oversee medical marijuana called the Oregon Medical Marijuana Program, which is a great resource, by the way. So as long as people use the marijuana in, in um, 
compliance with the regulations, which I'll talk about momentarily, and they have the physician's written approval. Um, they are immune for any, any prosecution under state law. Um, technically, it doesn't protect you against federal law, but I just mentioned that the Department of Justice is really not looking at prosecuting people for medical marijuana use in states where it's legal. Um, there's some common sense restrictions for people who use marijuana for medical purposes um, that it shouldn't be used in public, that you can't give it or sell it to other people, um, that if you use it and um, you are caught driving under the influence, it doesn't matter if you have a medical marijuana card, you can still be prosecuted. Um, and it doesn't protect you if you take the marijuana outside of Oregon into a state that doesn't have a law that provides for the legal use of medical marijuana. So in terms of what conditions qualify under our current laws, those include cancer, HIV or AIDS, glaucoma, post-traumatic stress disorder, and uh, of interest to you all, I think, is um, the degenerative or pervasive neurologic conditions category. So that would certainly include Parkinson's and also other conditions like uh, multiple sclerosis. And there's actually varying degrees of medical evidence supporting marijuana's use in the different conditions on this list. In addition, people can use marijuana for um, pain, severe nausea, seizures, muscle spasms, and cachexia, which is weight loss that's caused by a medical condition, not by just not eating enough, usually cancer or AIDS, but sometimes other medical conditions. In uh, July of this year, there were nearly 70,000 patients who were registered with the Oregon Medical Marijuana Program. And you can see here that the vast majority were registered for use for severe pain. Um, the numbers add up to more than 68,880 because people are registered to use it for more than one uh, purpose. Um, there are not very many who are primarily registered to use it for degenerative or pervasive neurologic conditions. A, a physician has to complete a written form, so both patient and physician have to complete a form that documents their condition. And it can't be a naturopath or a nurse practitioner um, or a physician assistant. It has to be a licensed medical doctor or a doctor of osteopathy. And the forms are available on the Medical Marijuana Program website. And it's very clear in the law that physicians don't, quote, prescribe medical marijuana. Or they can recommend its use. They can discuss its use. Um, but they aren't protected by the law if they specifically give marijuana to a patient or um, actually provide specific recommendations on use. Has anyone ever been prosecuted? Any, any doctor has ever been prosecuted for that? No, that hasn't happened. So I mentioned that the patient has to, to do an application, um, and that is accompanied by a fee, um, which ranges between $20 and $200, depending on whether you are signed up for public assistance. The Oregon Medical Marijuana Program is totally fee-supported. No tax dollars, at least at this point, go uh, to support it. And then um, there are some other restrictions about the number of plants that we'll go into um, and that a physician or nurse can give medical marijuana to patients who are in a facility. Um, so it's not that people in facilities are automatically excluded from using it. Uh, however, um, health care providers in those facilities have no obligation to do so and some facilities prohibit it. So the law in Oregon created the Medical Marijuana Dispensary, uh, which is regulated by the Oregon Health Authority. Basically, it's a place where um, growers can bring marijuana and people can come and buy it. Um, and there's some regulations about where those can be located. In 2014, there were more than 70 dispensaries, and now there are over 400. And um, there's a directory that's available online um, at the Oregon Medical Marijuana Program website. As of the 1st of October, um, medical marijuana um, user or medical marijuana dispensaries have to test and label all marijuana uh, with a number of, of um, um, 
labels and, and specifiers on the marijuana, and that's a really, really, really important law uh, because um, up until this point, um, there has been no regulation about whether marijuana needs to be tested and what needs to be tested and how it should be labeled, even though you go into a medical marijuana dispensary and you see that the, that the marijuana is labeled, those labels are not necessarily accurate. For example, in 2015, um, there was a study published in the Journal of American Medical Association, and um, what they did is they got uh, samples from dispensaries, not in Oregon, but in California and in Washington State, and several dispensaries in each state, and they tested it in uh, a regular medical laboratory. Uh, they tested it for active ingredients, and they also tested it for toxins. And one of the things that they found is that only 17% of those samples were accurately labeled. Now, this law is definitely providing people with more protection. So one of the concerns that doctors have about marijuana and patients, too, is that you don't really know what you're getting, whereas at least if you take a prescription medication, you know what's in that. Um, the laboratories testing the medical marijuana do need to be accredited by the state as well. So these are really important protections. And here's a breakdown of how medical and recreational marijuana differ under the law. Um, uh, they both require labeling and testing. You can see that you can have a lot more marijuana in your possession and, um, uh, if you have a medical marijuana that card than if it's recreational. The card costs money, uh, but the marijuana that's used for medical purposes is not taxed. So if you have a medical marijuana card, you don't pay taxes. The tax laws are sort of they're being looked at in terms of exactly how much it's going to cost. Um, but right now, at least as of my last uh, look at this earlier this month, it was $35 an ounce, plus 20 to 50 percent for recreational marijuana. And to give you an idea of what marijuana costs, um, there's yeah, it, you, you can go and this is a great variety of costs, you know, depending on the, the, the variety that you buy and the quality of it. Uh, but generally for um, medium to high quality marijuana, the average across Oregon, as, again as of earlier this month, was um, between 180 and about $210 per ounce. And if you are using marijuana by a cigarette, that's, that's about 30 cigarettes. So now I want to look at the scientific evidence. So there's some things I'd like for you to understand about scientific evidence in regard to marijuana um, before we talk about exactly what the studies show. And marijuana contains over 60, some people say a lot more than that, pharmacologic reactive compounds, namely compounds that actually cause some change in the body. And most of these active compounds are known by, as, uh, as a group by the term cannabinoids. And our body has cannabinoid receptors that they bind to our naturally occurring cannabinoids like anandamide and there's, there are several others. And there's two kinds of cannabinoid receptors. Um, one is the cannabinoid 1 receptors and those are mainly in the brain, the spinal cord, the nerves, and they cause pain relief. Um, they also cause some of the less desirable effects um, such as drowsiness and decreased motor and cognitive functioning. Um, and then the cannabinoid 2 receptors are mostly geared toward uh, reducing inflammation and immune function. Um, so both have important activities in relieving symptoms, as I will show in just a little bit. Um, it's been difficult to study marijuana, like I said, because it's on the DEA Schedule 1. Um, in addition to all of the hoops that researchers have to jump through um, in general to do scientific research on humans, um, they have multiple other hoops to do to jump through in order to study marijuana. Um, so that plus the fact that there's no um, wealthy pharmaceutical company supporting it has made it very difficult to get um, this uh, research. And there's also a problem with standardization. So marijuana is available in so many different forms um, that uh, different plants and strains and blends, they may differ and it's hard to compare them, right, between studies. Um, also, some marijuana is smoked, sometimes it's, it's taken in pills, um, so it's hard to compare those different forms. 
And then I think a really important one is it's hard to develop a true placebo. So the placebo response is a really important thing to measure, especially with neurologic conditions um, and psychological conditions. Um, it's, it's a really a a good asset, um, but it also hard, makes it hard to, to figure out whether it's actual drug or the expectations of the people who are taking it and the researchers who are measuring its effects. Um, because marijuana has such a characteristic effect on people, many of whom have used it as a recreational drug, so they're familiar with those effects, it's hard for us uh, to sort of, you know, have a, have a sugar pill, as you, as, you know, as it were. Um, it's hard to control for that expectation that they might feel better, whether they're feeling better because of the marijuana or whether they're just feeling better because of the expectation of feeling better, it's hard to sort out when they know that they're actually getting that active drug. Also want to understand that scientific evidence has kind of a, a hierarchy in terms of quality. So there's lower quality scientific evidence and there's higher quality scientific evidence. And um, so if someone tries a, a medicine and they said it works with them, for them, um, that's you know, interesting and useful place to start, but there's that possibility that that's a placebo effect or that it may have worked in that one person but not generally be useful. So as you get larger numbers, um, that is more helpful in truly determining whether something is effective. And the other part is what I mentioned earlier about um, placebo. So if um, uh, you have a, a series of cases or a case um, or even a uh, a study where some people are given the active medication and some people are given a placebo but they know which group they're in um, or they get to decide which group they're in which is an uncontrolled or, or non-randomized trial um, that that is less valid because um, the people who are choosing to take the active medicine may be different than the people who are choosing not to take it um, and if they know that they're getting an active medicine they may respond different, differently than if they don't think that they are getting an active medicine. Um, so the gold standard, as many of you probably know, in science, in medicine, and clinical research is the double-blind placebo-controlled trial. Double-blind means that neither the patient nor the researcher knows what they're getting, whether it's placebo or not. Um, so both people are uh, as it were, blind. Uh, and randomized means that um, people are randomly assigned to whether they get placebo or an active drug. So it sort of controls for, you know, factors that might play into whether somebody would want to take an active drug versus not. And then finally, there's something called a meta-analysis, which is where a whole bunch of double-blind placebo-controlled trials get sort of put together and the data is analyzed. And that gives you both the strength in numbers and the um, rigor of having placebo-controlled randomized trials. So last year, um, fortunately for us, there was a large meta-analysis published in the Journal of the American Medical Association about the use of cannabinoids, mainly marijuana, but also other things um, like purified tetrahydrocannabinol, which is the active ingredient in marijuana, or one of them, cannabidiol, which is the other active ingredient in marijuana. And I uh, got a question about what's the difference between cannabidiol and tetrahydrocannabidiol, and I'm going to answer that in a little bit. Um, but I'd like to get through the scientific research first, and then we'll come back to that when we are talking about what forms marijuana comes in and how they might be different. And then there are some prescription forms of marijuana. Uh, namely Marinol and Cisanet, and those are licensed in the U.S. They are to treat either HIV weight loss, HIV-related weight loss, or chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. And then there's a combination product of uh, tetrahydrocannabinol and cannabidiol that's not available in the U.S. So they looked at all of these different things, including smoked marijuana, edible marijuana, all of uh, the different forms of marijuana. And they looked at all of the studies. Um, they found 505 that were relevant, um, but only 79 of those were actually randomized trials. The vast majority of those dealt with either nausea and vomiting from chemotherapy or chronic pain or spasticity, that's really stiff um, muscles. So different kind of stiff muscles than come with Parkinson's disease. Um, 
usually related to multiple sclerosis and other diseases um, that sort of take out that um, the motor pathways, not the basal ganglia that controls Parkinson's, but the other motor pathways in the nervous system. And then there were a few others, um, psychosis, sleep disorders, glaucoma, anxiety, depression. Um, the study quality, you know, it's hard to have good study quality um, in any situation, but um, the control of the, you know, placebo controls and all of the different things that researchers look at in terms of the sort of how quality the studies are was moderate. Um, and this is a summary of what they found. So there's moderate quality evidence that marijuana can help chronic nerve pain. That's like from diabetes or from shingles. Pain that's related to cancer. So a couple of different kinds of pain. And the spasticity, that stiff muscles related to MS. There's lower quality evidence that it can help with the nausea and vomiting from chemotherapy. Um, that it can help people with HIV gain weight. That it can help people with sleep problems and Tourette's syndrome. Um, they also looked at how marijuana could harm people, what adverse events that they could have. There was overall a three times greater likelihood for an adverse event, but not all of those. Most of those were not serious. Um, and I would point out that no one has ever died from a marijuana overdose, which is a lot more than we can say from many of our prescription medications. Um, but the most common adverse effects were sort of what you would expect, euphoria, fatigue, drowsiness, dizziness, confusion, dry mouth, imbalance, hallucinations, and paranoia. And I'm going to go into more detail about side effects in just a bit. So why would marijuana possibly help Parkinson's disease? Well, there are cannabinoid receptors in the basal ganglia. That is the part of the brain that's most affected in Parkinson's disease. And if you look in what's called preclinical research, so research that's done um, on brains after death, autopsy results, or research that's done in animals, um, there's decreased cannabinoid receptors in the basal ganglia of people with Parkinson's. So that's like, hmm, well, that's interesting. Um, the basal ganglia and Parkinson's, and here we have decreased cannabinoid receptors. Maybe there is a key, and if we, you know, introduce cannabis or marijuana, that could help people with Parkinson's. But when they did that, um, in the lab, it actually reduced the dopamine release, which isn't what we want. We want more dopamine, work, not less, in Parkinson's disease. And then there are animal kind of models of Parkinson's disease. Um, so that um, uh, if they gave them the marijuana, um, it didn't seem to help them, but it did seem to protect the animals from developing Parkinson's disease if they gave them marijuana and then they exposed them to the toxins they used to induce Parkinson's. So there's some lower quality evidence clinically. Um, there is a pretty large survey study of people with Parkinson's disease. Um, and that found that 25%, um, uh, excuse me, about half of the 25% of people with Parkinson's disease who use marijuana did claim some benefits. So it helped them with tremor. It helped them with bradykinesia or slow movement. And um, it helped some of them with levodopa induced dyskinesia. Um, so that's uh, sort of abnormal movements that come out as a result of levodopa, which is the generic term for cinnamon. Um, there was a series of four patients who found improvement with REM sleep behavior disorder. That's acting out dreams, which is more common in people with Parkinson's than in the general population. Um, there was another case series, five patients, that showed of no benefit to tremor. Um, and then um, an open label study with 22 patients that did find benefit for tremor, rigidity, pain, and sleep. So kind of mixed results here. Uh, but again, as I mentioned, these are people who are getting marijuana who know they're getting marijuana and the researchers know that they're getting it. So is it is it the marijuana or is it more of a placebo effect? We don't really know from these studies. There are some more uh, higher quality studies that did do randomization and placebo controls. Um, and one did find some benefit who are levodopa induced with kinesia, but not other Parkinson's symptoms like the slow moves, the bradykinesia, or the tremors. Um, and then there was another study that said no improvement in levodopa induced kinesia um, or other Parkinson's symptoms. And, 
And then um, finally, there was a trial of cannabidiol, which again, I'm going to get to the differences between those two substances, but they're both from the marijuana plant with 21 Parkinson's patients, showed no improvement in the core symptoms of Parkinson's disease like tremor and bradykinesia, but at the highest dose, there was some benefit for quality of life. So while the receptors for cannabinoids are decreased in the brains of people with Parkinson's, we haven't really shown exactly how, you know, that could biologically, is there a way that that could really make a difference um, yet? And to change that, to bind those receptors with cannabis or marijuana. Um, there is pretty limited data, right? Only three trials with a total of 33 participants. And when you look at the, the trials that are conducted for um, pharmaceutical studies, um, there have to be, you know, hundreds or sometimes even thousands of patients in those clinical trials to really fulfill the FDA's requirements to include those medications. So I would say so far, um, we don't have a lot of evidence to show that marijuana benefits people with Parkinson's disease, at least for the core symptoms like tremor or bradykinesia, even though one study did show that quality of life might improve, and that's a really important thing. And I would say about all of this that um, someone once said, it's been attributed to various people, including Carl Sagan, that the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. That we don't have data is not the same as saying that it's, well, it's foregone conclusion that it doesn't work, but it isn't very promising yet. So I'm going to talk about, even though we don't have a lot of evidence that Parkinson's disease does help the core symptoms of Parkinson's, like tremor or slow movement, it may help Parkinson's, people with Parkinson's in other ways. For example, pain affects more than two-thirds of people with Parkinson's disease, and sleep disturbance almost two-thirds of people with Parkinson's disease. And I showed earlier that one of the benefits that's pretty strong here is that, that marijuana can help pain. And there's some less um, compelling evidence that it can help sleep disturbances. So marijuana could help people with Parkinson's, but perhaps not at this point, based on the scientific research, with the core symptoms. And that's also not to say that some people might benefit, right? In these clinical trials, this is an aggregate result, so, a, you know, yes or no, but there are people in these trials, and some of them had some benefit and some of them did not. Um, but overall, we haven't seen a real strong uh, sense that, that marijuana is going to be helpful for the core um, um, Parkinson's symptoms. So, I want to talk about some more specifics about how marijuana could be less helpful to people with Parkinson's because I think you should know that side of things as well. And I mentioned that in the, in the meta-analysis, um, overall, the incidence of any adverse effect was greater, three times greater than placebo. Again, these were not severe typically, um, but you can see some of these symptoms, it wouldn't matter if you had Parkinson's or not like sleepiness. I mean, that's not a good effect, but it's not necessarily going to affect people with Parkinson's differentially. Same, as, same with dry mouth. Um, same with euphoria. Um, but people who have Parkinson's disease can be more prone to having cognitive problems, um, problems with memory, concentration, and orientation. People with Parkinson's can also be more prone to having balance problems. And then finally, um, some of the medicines that people take for Parkinson's can predispose to um, having hallucinations or paranoia, and sometimes even nausea. Um, so uh, when marijuana is added to some of those effects, it might be more of a problem for people who have Parkinson's than people who don't have Parkinson's. Now, when saying this about that possible adverse effects, there are some important disclaimers. Um, one is that the same problems with confusion, balance, and hallucinations can be caused by many conventional medicines used for pain, right? Especially the opioid medicines, things like Vicodin uh, or Percocet or Narco. Um, so I would say there's only been one study that I could find that compared those conventional medicines for pain to marijuana, and I did find that the conventional medicines were superior. Um, but it's, but they both have those side effects. 
Uh, and also most conventional medicines um, for sleep disturbances can cause problems with confusion, balance, and hallucinations. And this is the important part. So cannabidiol, cannabidiol is a uh, cannabinoid, just like tetrahydrocannabinol. Um, it's only slightly chemically different um, from um, the tetrahydrocannabinol. And someone asked, what's the difference? It's, it's just basically a couple of um, different atoms, um, but they seem to have very different kind of effects on the body. Um, and I mentioned that the um, uh, cannabidiol um, in that one study seemed to improve quality of life in people with Parkinson's disease. Um, and it's very interesting, the cannabidiol and, and preparations that have a high ratio of cannabidiol to tetrahydrocannabinol. Um, so more cannabidiol than tetrahydrocannabinol. Um, which I'm going to refer to as THC from now on. Um, they don't seem to have the ill effects. They don't seem to have. Um, they, they don't seem to cause hallucinations. They don't seem to cause confusion. Um, so that's a real kind of important thing I think for you to know. Um, the other important thing is that cannabidiol has not been studied as much, so we we don't see. Uh, you know, it's good evidence for benefit either. Um, that doesn't mean it's not there. Um, but uh, except for epilepsy, we don't really have a lot of evidence that it helps with some of the core symptoms of like pain and sleep disturbance. And I also want to emphasize that just like with prescription medicines, not everybody loves side effects. Um, you, no one would take any medication if they really listened and read those um, and took it to heart because those list of side effects usually pertain to only less than 10% of people. So who would be more at risk for harm taking marijuana? Well, anyone with a cognitive problem, uh, certainly with a diagnosis of dementia, everyone should avoid driving for at least eight hours. People who have a history of hallucinations or delusions, that's having full beliefs. People who have balance difficulties. <clears throat> and people who have severe heart problems. So. Marijuana, that is tetrahydrocannabinol, causes the heart rate to increase. And for someone with an unhealthy heart, that could cause excessive strain. Um, so you would have to talk, if you had a heart condition, um, especially something that, where you were having chest pain, um, you would really want to talk with your doctor about whether marijuana could be safe for you. Although probably if you could tolerate moderate exercise, it would be okay. So lastly, I want to talk about practical information. The first question is, why won't my doctor talk to me about marijuana? And um, there are lots of reasons for that. I'm not sure that they're all necessarily completely valid because I do feel like your doctor should talk to you about marijuana, um, that they may not be able to give you specific recommendations. Um, but I think to talk to you about your questions is really important just about anything that you might want to try or think about uh, using to help your physical condition. But there are some reasons that I certainly can think of. One is that doctors are more familiar with marijuana's harms and its benefits. We know about um, things like what I mentioned, the cognitive issues, um, the cardiac issues, the heart issues. Um, we know that uh, uh, when people use it recreationally, which is very different, and we don't have the data on medical users, but when people use it re uh, recreationally, about 9% of them do develop an addiction to it. Um, so doctors are trained to first do no harm, so we're a little hesitant about something that we're not as familiar with, especially when we're not more familiar with the harm with it. The other thing is because um, we don't have good standardization because this is not regulated by the FDA um, or produced by a pharmaceutical company that has very, very, very stringent guidelines. Um, uh, we can't really provide guidelines about this, not good guidelines anyway. We're very concerned about liability. If we recommend anything, um, is the patient going to use it and get in a car accident? Are they going to get addicted? And I think that's present even with conventional medications, but more so with this, with this product. And then I think a huge one is concerns about adverse actions by the Drug Enforcement Administration. So um, anyone who prescribes controlled substances, so controlled substances include opioid medicines like Vicodin, for example, and benzodiazepines like Ativan or Clomipin. 
Uh, we have to have a license to prescribe those. It's different from a regular medical license. And um, doctors are very worried that if we are, you know, prescribing quote unquote marijuana, um, that, you know, we might get in trouble for that. And the Drug Enforcement Administration is a federal agency, not a state agency. So even though um, there have been assurances that they will um, prosecute us, I think some doctors are still worried about that. Um, and losing your DEA license is a big deal. Um, it, it can also, um, you can also be uh, prosecuted for misusing it on criminal grounds and then do jail time. So we're really worried about that. However, um, in 2002, there was a court case here, uh, not in Oregon, I don't think, but the Ninth Court um, is, does include Oregon. And they ruled that in a state where medical marijuana is legal, the federal government may not prosecute a physician for discussing pros and cons of medical marijuana or issuing a general recommendation to use it. So um, if your doctor won't talk to you about marijuana and the, the fears of prosecution is the reason, this, you can, you can uh, share this study with them, or this court case with them. Um, physicians may be held liable if they specifically prescribe or dispense marijuana to a patient. Um, so that's a little bit different than a general recommendation and discussion. So where can you get information if your doctor doesn't talk to you? Um, one is through the Mayo Clinic website that I have up here. Um, they actually have a lot of good information about other kinds of alternative remedies, but they have specific dosing suggestions based on the clinical trial that um, I alluded to earlier. And then in terms of finding out about the law, getting, finding a dispensary and getting a card, the Oregon Medical Marijuana Program website is a great resource. So mar marijuana comes in a variety of forms, as you probably know. Um, and those forms, I think, have differences in the way they act on the body, and some are more advantageous than others. Um, and this includes pill forms. Pill forms um, um, as I said, there are a couple of prescription medications that include tetrahydrocannabinol. So smoked marijuana, it affects people rapidly within 5 to 15 minutes, but the smoke can be potentially toxic, just like cigarette smoke, and it doesn't smell really good. Um, and vaporized forms also have a rapid onset. It's less toxic than smoke, but probably not completely free of uh, potential for lung problems. So definitely those two options are not the best for people with lung conditions in, in particular. Now, edible marijuana and, and food and teas, they have a, another kind of problem. So they, they act really slowly, um, and they last for a long, long time. Um, and the problem is people will take it, and they won't feel it. Um, and then so they'll take more, and then they'll end up overdosing on it. And like I said, you can't die from an overdose, but, um, you know, it, it can be very unpleasant. Um, people can get really paranoid and anxious. Um, and then, of course, if children or pets consume those, it can be. And there have been some children who have had some very serious, serious adverse reactions. So tinctures where a plant is soaked in really high proof alcohol, um, like vodka, um, which is then evaporated off. And it leaves a very high concentrate of marijuana and liquid. And that's put under the tongue. And the, the uh, marijuana can actually go directly into the circulation um, that way. And that gives it a more rapid onset of action, um, almost as fast as if it's smoked. Definitely more uh, uh, rapid than if it's eaten, which usually takes up to a couple of hours. This can be very potent, so very tiny amounts are usually good to start off with. It's known by the term green dragon for that reason. And then there are bombs, which are uh, manufactured similarly, but it's put directly on the skin. And that could be helpful if there's one area that's painful, but the rest of you is OK. And then there's these prescription medications that are FDA approved for weight loss for HIV AIDS or nausea and vomiting from chemotherapy. And um, the problem with these is they're very expensive. Um, and because it would be an off-label use um, to use it for pain or Parkinson's disease, um, the insurance companies would not cover it. Where can you get marijuana? Well, as I mentioned, the Oregon Medical Marijuana Program has a directory. It's a searchable online directory. Um, and there are also privately owned directories, such as weedmaps.com. And this also includes customer ratings. So like everything else, um, 
people can give their readings to a marijuana dispensary. And I would say, rather than relying on others, um, to just go and visit some and get a feel for how knowledgeable the staff are and how professional they are. And of course, consult with your friends and family. How to use marijuana safely? Well, I recommend the tinctures of the balm rather than the smoked or the edibles for the reasons I discussed. And I also recommend choosing the variety that has a high ratio of cannabidiol, um, which is chemically very like tetrahydrocannabinol, but has a very different effect on the body. It seems to, um, by it binds to the same receptors and, and may even just compete for the receptor binding, but it seems to reduce the adverse effects like confusion, hallucinations, and fast heartbeat. Um, but also, as I mentioned before, um, while there's all sorts of information on the internet about cannabidiol being of medical benefit, there's really not much research about that except um, in the area of seizures. So some common sense tips to have someone else present when you use marijuana, especially the first time. To start with a low dose and wait at least an hour before dosing again or even longer if it's inedible. Again, to avoid driving um, for at least eight hours after use not mix it with alcohol. And I would avoid it if you have severe heart problems, ongoing hallucinations, or you know, significant cognitive impairment. So in conclusion, um, the scientific evidence of that marijuana has been limited by its status as a Schedule I controlled substance. There are ongoing efforts to change that, and I'm very hopeful about that. Um, so far, there's no high quality evidence that it directly helps with symptoms of Parkinson's disease like tremor or slow movement, but it could help with pain or sleep problems. There is good scientific evidence to support that, especially pain, and those problems affect the majority of people with Parkinson's disease. Um, you should use some caution, especially, um, as I mentioned, if you have some of the problems like um, cognitive impairment or, or heart problems. Um, just, just um, you know, recognizing the potential for confusion, hallucinations, and well, even with the high cannabidiol to tetrahydrocannabinol ratios, until you know how it affects you. And then um, I have some references up here. I strongly recommend the um, the actual. Um, there are a couple for Parkinson's, but the, the one that um, the JAMA uh, Journal of American Medical Association. The last one on that list, the cannabinoids for medical aid use, um, it is pretty jargony, um, but it's very comprehensive, it's very high quality, and it is available in the public domain. So if you're curious about the scientific evidence, I would start with that one. Thank you. Hello? Okay, we will take some questions now if you want to submit some questions in the question box. Um, and Dr. Cloak will have um, a few for you in the chat box as well. Okay, so um, one question, is medical marijuana stronger than regular marijuana? Um, and the answer is, um, it depends. Uh, I think that if you go into a dispensary, um, especially now that we're having people actually label these a accurately, um, there will be labels as to how much tetrahydrocannabinol or THC is in a particular uh, strain or a particular um, preparation, um, whether that's actual um, you know, marijuana leaf, or whether it's um, the tinctures that I was talking about, or whether it's an edible preparation. And so the, the percent of um, tetrahydrocannabinol is, is kind of the indication of how strong it is. Um, and it really, um, I mean, the, if, you, if you get it sort of outside of the dispensary, you're not really going to know how strong it is. If you do get it in a dispensary, it's one of the uh, arguments for, for going that route, um, although, as I said, recreational marijuana is also going to be required to be labeled with the strain. Um, so it's really the percentage of THC and the higher percentages are going to be stronger. Um, 
And then the other question is cannabidiol or CBD? So CBD uh, is a shorthand and acronym for cannabidiol. Um, so they're, they're the same thing. Um, another question, do studies show if marijuana affects inflammation? So there is some research to show that marijuana decreases inflammation. That's a re or, excuse me, inflammation. That's a really good question. And in particular, um, uh, there's, um, I think I mentioned that there's two types of cannabinoid receptors in the body, the cannabinoid 1 receptors, which are mainly in the brain and the, the nerve, um, and then there's the cannabinoid 2 receptors, and they are found mostly in the um, immune cells, like the white blood cells, and also other immune cells in the bone marrow. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, it seems like um, when people are given, uh, and animals are given cannabis, cannabis cannabinoids, that those cells become less active. Um, there has been some concern that people who use a lot of marijuana could become actually have too less, too, not enough immunity. I, that hasn't really been borne out. Um, but it's thought that the decrease in inflammation is one of the ways that ways that marijuana reduces pain. Um, so you know, inflammation affects the nerves and it causes pain. And even though there's also a, a direct kind of effect on in the brain and the spinal cord on pain levels, it's also thought that marijuana reduces inflammation and that that relieves pain. And there's, again, there's not enough research, um, but um, there are questions about, well, if it works for that, would it help people with autoimmune conditions? And I didn't really focus in on that um, today. I think there is some preclinical research. It's not something that's um, out sort of in terms of doing human studies, at least in mainstream medicine. Oh, good question. If I could get marijuana from a recreational supplier, why would I get a mar medical marijuana card? So that's a great question. Um, and I think that, you know, it, I would I would have that question too, um, and I uh, I think the main reason medical people are probably still going to be getting marijuana cards at uh, at this point is um, it, it 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 just feels more legitimate, um, you know, but you're still immune from prosecution at least in Oregon, um, and the other is the taxes. Um, so the taxes can be quite high. In the, the card, you pay a one-time fee. Or not a one-time fee, I'm sorry, it's an annual fee, um, which is pretty low if, if you receive public assistance. And then you don't have to pay taxes. You can also have more marijuana in your possession. So whether that's, you know, you know uh, something that you feel like is necessary, like 24 ounces, that's a lot versus eight ounces. Um, Probably most users aren't going to need more than eight ounces at a time. Um, but those are some of the reasons why people might want a medical marijuana card. So are dispensary staff required to know the scientific information? No, um, they're not. And there's a wide variety in terms of their knowledge uh, levels. And would a tincture obtain from a Recreational dispensary be different from a tincture obtained with a medical marijuana card. No, um, again, that uh, uh, the law about labeling things um, is going to apply to both recreational and med medical marijuana. Um, the only difference would potentially be that you're not paying as much in terms of the taxes. And I, this question, is there any reciprocity between states for medical marijuana? I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, that is not, um, you know, more of a legal question, and I'm sorry to have to disappoint you about that. Um, I, I would not want to give you misinformation about that. So what side effects are associated with cannabidiol or CBD? Uh, so far, it seems to be pretty side effect 
free if you have pre, you know, pure cannabidiol. Um, the thing that I mentioned earlier is there's not a lot of evidence yet that it's helpful. That doesn't mean that it's not. It just hasn't been researched except for epilepsy. Um, but there doesn't seem to be any at least short-term side effects associated with using cannabidiol. Um, question, is there essential oil suspension available rather than a balm for severely allergic or celiac folks? Um, you know, I, again, I don't know the answer to that one. However, um, I think that a, a good dispensary could probably make something um, and probably have something out there given that this, these problems are so common in our population um, that if you went to, uh, you know, uh, dispensaries and asked about what exactly they have in stock or can they even make something up for you, I know mainstream pharmacies will do that. Um, some mainstream pharmacies will do that specifically for a person who has specific allergies. So they may be um, open to doing that if they don't even have it available. Uh, autophagy was a big topic. Um, and are marijuana receptors connected to in the microglia? So I don't know very much about that very aspect of the basic research. Um, and I do know that marijuana is, um, there's a lot of research underway about sort of uh, preventing or slowing neurodegenerative process. Um, and I think that there's some really promising preclinical evidence that that may um, take place, but I, I can't speak to the actual uh, specifics about autophagy. Um, if there are no side effects with cannabidiol, does that mean cognitive function remains normal and one could drive after taking it? Um, so it's like everything else. Um, you are relying on the purity of the uh, and the honesty and, and, and the sort of we're, we're still in a in a time a kind of early time of regulating what's in what, right? And um, so I wouldn't go out and drive after taking something labeled as pure cannabidiol myself um, until I knew how it affected me just because even though there are no cognitive side effects that we're aware of, um, you may not be getting pure cannabidiol. The only way that you would do that is if you, um, you know, participated in a research study and got it from, uh, you know, um, a researcher where they were under an institutional uh, review board. And um, they had to have something that was absolutely pure because of their own liability concerns. I think right now um, we're still pretty early on in this, and I guess I would just say um, to use caution just because what it, we're not necessarily, uh, it's October, you know, and we just started this having the actual testing and having that be accurate. Remember, um, in the study, only 17% of the marijuana was accurately labeled. So um, that would be my answer is that if it truly was pure cannabidiol, you shouldn't have a problem, but I think you would be wise to use caution. Um, last question, can we get a copy of slides? Um, it's fine with me to distribute the slides. Um, that would have to go through uh, Melissa. Absolutely. And it's 1 o'clock, so we're actually going to wrap this up. If you would like a copy of slides or have any further questions, I know that we didn't get to all the questions, um, please feel free to email me at melissa at parkinsonsresources.org. Thank you so much, Dr. Cloak, for this going over this topic with us. This is one that we get asked about a lot, and so it's great to bring some research and information um, to the population. And thank you so much for everyone for participating. Um, so we're also doing a recording of this webinar, and a recording of the webinar should be up on the Northwest Parkinson's Foundation, which is nwpf.org, um, within a couple weeks. 
And again, if you have any questions or would like the slides, please feel free to email me at melissa at parkinsonsresources.org. And have a great day. This concludes our webinar broadcast. Thank you.